It has been a little while since we last covered the history of a samurai clan here on the channel, but at last, now with the conclusion of the Sengoku Jidai series, I think it is right that we get back on track with covering the history of these famous samurai families. As you may be already well aware, the way that I choose which samurai clan history I am covering next is always placed in the hands of my loyal supporters on Patreon, who are the ones who recommend clans to me and then vote on which ones they would like me to see make videos on. This month they have selected a fascinating clan, who some might consider to be a little bit of a minor player throughout Japanese history. Yet, I assure you, there is certainly a lot of really interesting stuff here for you to learn. This month we are covering the Azai clan. If you are at all familiar with the history of the Sengoku period, then you know just how significant this clan actually would turn out to be, as they would of course come to directly impact the legacy of the first great unifier, Oda Nobunaga, and even later come to heavily influence the very conclusion of the entire Sengoku period. Yet, before we go any further, I'd like to first bring on a special guest who will be coming along to help tell the story of the Azai. Hi everyone! A lot of you likely don't know me, and for those that do, this may come as a bit of a surprise. Within the Final Fantasy community, I go by Nobutaka, and in most history fandoms, I go by Nobuyumi. I am a Final Fantasy XIV content creator and host of the community interview podcast Coffee and Carbuncles over on Spotify. However, outside of Final Fantasy XIV, I have another passion, and that's Japanese history. I've been fascinated with the Sengoku Jidai since childhood, and my favorite clan that I tend to be rather vocal about is the Azai, particularly their final leader Nagamasa. While it's easy to simply write off the Azai as that clan that betrayed the Oda and then got destroyed, there is so much more to their story than that, and I am very excited to help bring that story to you all here today. I'm really glad to have Nobuyumi along with us, as well as excited for you all to learn about and fully explore the lesser known history of this fascinating samurai family. The Asai clan traced their lineage back to the Heian era, claiming to be descendants of the Hoke branch of the Fujiwara clan. Yet, the first time they appear to us in any noteworthy fashion, is with the birth of Asai Tsukamasa in 1491. Now, before we talk about Tsukamasa, I want to briefly discuss the Azai clan crest or Kamon with you all. The simplest way I can describe the crest would be three hexagons in a triangle pattern with a flower centered inside each hexagon, but I'd like to dive deeper than that. The hexagon arrangement of the crest is called Kiko. The design is from the Heian period and was seen primarily on armor, it's meant to resemble a tortoise shell and is believed to be a sign of both fortune and luck. Meanwhile, the flower arrangement within the Kiko is called Hanabishi and was a common design choice among noble families as it was considered to be both aesthetically pleasing and a good sign to have upon one's home. The particular flowers in the Azai crest are four-leafed water caltrops and are primarily seen in China. It is rumored that the Hanabishi of the Asai crest is arranged in a pattern similar to that of the Asakura to show respect to their clan and as thanks for helping support the Asai's rise to power. Unfortunately, I am unable to confirm this as fact. Alright, now that we've spoken about the Kamon, let's get back to Tsukamasa. At the time of Tsukamasa's birth, the Azai family were serving as vassals of the Kyogoku clan. They were neither daimyo nor had a castle to call their own. Following the end of the Onin War, the Kyogoku had been made governors of several different districts across various provinces of Japan. This included three districts in northeastern Omi, where the Asai would be stationed. In 1523, turmoil arose within the Kyogoku when Kyogoku Takakyo attempted to appoint his second son, Kyogoku Takeyoshi, as his successor. Tsukamasa, however, supported Takenobu, Takakyo's eldest son, as successor, and thus, a clan conflict arose. Tsukamasa and his allies managed to exile Takeyoshi to Owari province, and Kyogoku Takenobu was appointed as clan head. However, 
Takanobu proved to be a rather ineffective leader, and seeing a chance to gain land of his own, Tsukamasa rose up and claimed the area northeast of Lake Biwa as his own domain. Shortly after pushing the Kyogoku clan out to Owari with the help of other regional officials, Tsukamasa would construct Odani Castle, a beautiful mountaintop fortress overlooking what is now the city of Nagahama. With the Kyogoku pushed out and his castle now built, Tsukamasa started expanding his territory until it bordered that of the ruling clan of Southern Omi, the Rokaku to the south, and that of the Asakura family to the north. It would be the Rokaku that would act as long-term rivals of the Azai for control over Omi province. Now, while the Rokaku and Azai shared a border, the Rokaku were also distant relatives of the Kyogoku. It would be at the behest of the ousted Kyogoku clan that the Rokaku would declare war upon Tsukamasa. Over the next year, several clashes took place between the Azai and both the Rokaku and Kyogoku clans. Yet, it would be in these difficult times that Tsukamasa would show his talents as a leader. Not only did he start diplomatic missions to the Kyogoku to try and patch things up between their clans, but simultaneously kept up a strong defense against repeated Rokaku assaults from the south. Sadly, the Rokaku end up being far stronger than the Asai were prepared for, and it's at this time Tsukamasa formed strong ties with his northern neighbors, the Asakura. A powerful clan in their own right, the Asakura must have welcomed having a friendly clan sitting between the Rokaku and themselves. It is this Asai Asakura alliance that would of course be important later on when discussing the fate of both clans. Unfortunately, before Tsukamasa can achieve any meaningful peace with either the Kyogoku or the Rokaku, he would pass away in 1542. Ironically, just like with the Kyogoku clan he betrayed, Tsukamasa's passing would plunge the Azai into a civil war between the adopted son of Tsukamasa, a man named Teya Akimasa, and Tsukamasa's biological heir, Azai Hisamasa. Tsukamasa's adopted son-in-law, Teya Akimasa, was quick to petition the Kyogoku to side with him in defeating Tsukamasa's eldest son, Hisamasa. With the Kyogoku and half his own clan now fighting him, Hisamasa needed allies. Thus, declaring an end to the conflict with the Rokaku, he attempts to strike a deal with them. If the Rokaku aid Hisamasa in gaining control of the clan, then the Azai will become Rokaku vassals. Seeing a chance to expand their territory without continuing what at this point was an almost two decade long conflict, the Rokaku accepted, and with their aid, Hisamasa became Lord of the Asai. In exchange for his new position, both as Lord of the clan and also as the newest Rokaku vassal, Hisamasa not only marries his son Nagamasa to the daughter of the Rokaku Lord, but forces Nagamasa to take a character from the Rokaku Lord's name and change his name to Hatamasa instead. With these signs of their subservience, the Azai would spend the next few years as loyal Rokaku vassals. Now, unfortunately, this didn't sit well with a lot of the clan. The retainers that had served Tsukamasa no doubt felt a deep sense of shame as the independence they had worked so hard to obtain was now seemingly gone. At the same time, retainers within the clan that had been loyal to Teya Akimasa and already weren't fond of Hisamasa's leadership, began debating raising arms against him. As these negative feelings spread throughout the clan, the most susceptible to this seemed to be Hisamasa's own heir, Nagamasa. In 1560, Nagamasa, currently going by Katamasa due to the deal struck with the Rokaku, ends up sending his wife back to the Rokaku clan and declared that he had changed his name back to Nagamasa, shunning Rokaku control of the Asai. Nagamasa then gathers every loyal retainer he can find and marches south to fight the Rokaku in what would later be known as the Battle of Narada. Accounts on exactly how the battle went vary, but what's important to know is that Nagamasa, leading an army of only 11,000 men, 
goes to challenge an estimated 25,000 strong Rokaku force at the border of their clans. In the initial skirmish, the Azai forces are brutally defeated. Yet, this doesn't stop them. After the initial skirmish, with Nagamasa's leadership, they only seem to become emboldened, and ultimately, this 11,000 strong force ends up pushing the Rokaku out of Asai territory and back south. After the stunning victory at Narada, the Asai retainers demand Nagamasa become ruler of the clan, and even go so far as to force his father Hisamasa into temporary exile at Chikubu, a small island located within Lake Biwa. Following the rise of Nagamasa to the position of Daimyo, and with a new war declared upon the Rokaku, it is here that the Asai seek new allies, and where their diplomatic ties with the Oda begin, and their ties with the Asakura strengthen. It is these events, and what comes after, that I think most people are probably best familiar with when discussing the Azai. Now, we are going to be getting back into the realm of what I covered during the Sengoku Jidai series, so this is where I'll take back over. As you may be already well aware, 1560 was a very significant year, not just for the Azai, but also for the Oda, a family who held influence over the small province of Owari to the east. Just as Nagamasa was coming into new heights, so was Oda Nobunaga after his tremendous victory over the Imagawa at Okehezama. But while Nobunaga was able to seize the advantage of his newfound power by soon conducting a lengthy invasion of Mino province to the north, Nagamasa was sadly unable to capitalize on his own position due to the fact that the hostile Rokaku continued to tie him down. He did make an effort to invade Mino as well, hoping to seize some of the land for himself as Nobunaga did in the wake of Saito Yoshitatsu's death, the figure who had previously lorded over Mino. Yet when Nagamasa attempted to move, he was attacked by the Rokaku from behind, forcing him to turn back to deal with the threat. Nobunaga viewed the situation with the Azai cautiously. On one hand, they could be seen as a rival clan trying to steal away land in Mino for themselves, while on the other hand, they could also be a potential ally against a mutual enemy. Additionally, Nobunaga probably liked the idea of having friends to the west, and if and when he did decide to march his armies in that direction, it would certainly smooth the entire process. Thus, with more benefits to it, Nobunaga took the route of friendship with the Azai, sending diplomats to Nagamasa. Terms were drafted for their alliance in the eventual result of the Saito's capitulation in Mino. And despite some outcry from those within the clan who were against any notion of an alliance with the Oda, Nagamasa saw the terms as overall being well favored for the Azai and perhaps very fruitful in the years to come. Nagamasa was even to marry Nobunaga's sister, Oichi, as a mark to strengthen the bonds between the two families. Yet one of the biggest complaints for the alliance came from the Asakura, who held resentment towards the Oda, as through Nobunaga's invasion of Mino, the border between the Oda and the Asakura had become an area of tension. Yet Nagamasa tried to ensure that as long as an alliance stood between the Azai and Oda, the Asakura would be safe from any Oda aggression. By 1567, the Oda invasion of Mino had been completed and Nagamasa, had been married to Oichi. Soon, Nobunaga's eyes began to look west as we know they would, settling on the imperial capital Kyoto, Nobunaga's next and true ambition. Nobunaga used the excuse of restoring Ashikaga Yoshiaki to the position of Shogun, as Yoshiaki had fled into exile in years past and had recently taken up with the Asakura. But now, with Nobunaga as a truer champion to his cause, Nobunaga spearheaded a path west, and with the Azai as his loyal ally, in 1568, they began their great campaign. Of course, the Rokaku ever obstinately stood to block their path, but they would be quickly overwhelmed as Oda and Azai forces swept them aside. This also, of course, had the effect of further strengthening Nagamasa's position in the region, as he and his powerful ally had pushed away his main rival. And with the way clear, it was not long before Nobunaga seized the capital and placed Yoshiaki as the new shogun. Things were looking up for the Azai. 
For two years, Nagamasa sat atop the world between mighty allies all around him and with a powerful clan of his own. Briefly, peace and stability had come. Yet, it was sadly not to last. In 1570, Nobunaga, who had been merely using the restored shogun as a puppet to justify his own aims, was becoming increasingly ambitious. Some might even say tyrannical. In that year, Nobunaga wished to have a greater assessment of who his allies and enemies were, who he could trust and who he could not. He invited a number of regional daimyo to Kyoto to attend a banquet, likely to pay some form of homage to Yoshiaki but really as a method for Nobunaga to test those around him. And as it just so happened, Asakura Yoshikage, who had always been wary of the Oda, refused the invitation. Seeing the Asakura now as a potential threat, Nobunaga made plans to eliminate them. As Oda armies began to flood north to destroy the Asakura, Nagamasa was caught in the middle. What was he going to do? remain loyal to his standing alliance and friendship with the Asakura, or stand with his brother-in-law and powerful ally Nobunaga. The question must have plagued him and gnawed at him internally, until finally it appears some measure of guilt overcame him. Nagamasa would betray Nobunaga in favor of the Asakura. Perhaps he had come to see Nobunaga as too ambitious or tyrannical and the Asakura were the safer ally to maintain. Or perhaps he just put more honor in the alliance with the Asakura, which had existed long before the Oda had come into the picture. One theory even suggests that Nagamasa might have simply decided to side with the Asakura because the Oda failed to warn him that they were going to be assaulting the Asakura, something Nagamasa may have wanted express warning of if it was to occur at any point. Whatever the case, it took Nobunaga completely by surprise when the Azai sallied forth and began attacking his rear. Caught off guard and now stuck between two enemy armies, Nobunaga made a desperate retreat back to Kyoto where he would reamass his forces and prepare for a new campaign against now both the Asakura and the Azai. What would follow would be one of the most significant samurai battles of the entire period as Nobunaga and his Tokugawa allies would press forth to crush the traitors. He would end up clashing with the Azai and Asakura forces at Anegawa, where it is estimated some 46,000 troops would meet. It would be a hard-fought day of slaughter that nearly ended with Nobunaga's defeat as the Azai pushed forth with a momentous onslaught. Yet with the Asakura being pushed back on the opposite flank and Tokugawa support arriving to aid the Oda, Soon the Azai would be repelled as well, with the day ending in an Oda victory. This was to be just the start of the war, however, as over the course of the next three years, the Azai and Asakura continued to fight against Nobunaga, who was becoming increasingly beset by enemies on all sides. The coalition against the Oda was growing, as even Shogun Ashikaga Yoshiaki began calling out for aid in overthrowing Nobunaga. Things got even worse for Nobunaga when the great Takeda Shingen and his mighty clan in the east rallied in support of the anti-Oda coalition, marching west in 1573 and crushing the Tokugawa at the Battle of Mikatagahara. Yet with Shingen's sudden death later that year, all the Takeda's momentum withered out, and Nobunaga was free to once again return his attention to the Azai and Asakura. Things were now looking increasingly grim for Nagamasa and Asakura Yoshikage as Nobunaga's armies had worn them down after years of fighting. By the fall of 1573, Oda forces were laying siege to both the Asakura power base at Ichijodani and soon enough the Azai power base at Odani. First the Asakura would fall, and then a month later, Nagamasa would make his last desperate stand. It is here some stories suggest something very surprising that would occur. Nobunaga, who famously was extremely harsh in situations of betrayal, is said to have actually offered Nagamasa the opportunity to surrender and take up new land in Yamato province. Nobunaga may have either considered Nagamasa an honorable leader, simply caught in a bad situation, or perhaps he even wanted to spare him, being that he was his own brother-in-law. In the end, Nagamasa would refuse any notion of surrender but instead sent his wife Oichi and their young children out to the safety of the Oda. It is believed that Oichi, who loved Nagamasa dearly, initially refused to go, but was finally persuaded to. 
With this, Nagamasa and the rest of the Azai family all committed seppuku, and the Azai name faded into history. Nobunaga is believed to have received his sister and her children warmly, although stories also lead to a darker fate that would come shortly after. It is said that Nobunaga had Nagamasa's young son, Mampukumaru, secretly beheaded as a measure to ensure the Azai were truly wiped out. While other stories also say that Nobunaga would have Nagamasa and Yoshikage's heads lacquered in gold and presented at a great feast to celebrate the victory. Yet although Nagamasa was now dead, the story of the Azai does not quite end here. Oichi and her three remaining daughters that she had with Nagamasa would of course live on, with Oichi eventually being remarried to the famous Oda general Shibata Katsuye. Although, after the death of her first husband, Nagamasa, she would finally die alongside her new husband. After the Honoji incident, which saw her brother Nobunaga finally killed, and the subsequent falling out between Hashiba Hideyoshi and Shibata Katsuie, which would result in the Battle of Shizugatake, it was now here, with Katsuie's defeat, that she would choose to die faithfully by her new husband something she was not able to do with her beloved Nagamasa ten years prior. This time, her daughters would be sent out to Hideyoshi, as she and Katsuie died and their castle burned all around them. The remaining three daughters would be either remarried or taken as concubines, with Hideyoshi himself taking the eldest. She was often called by the name Chacha, but today we remember her better as Yorodono the eventual mother of Toyotomi Hideyoshi's only true son and heir, Hideyori. This makes Toyotomi Hideyori technically the grandson of Azai Nagamasa. As we can see, the Azai bloodline would have one last major impact on the period. After Hideyoshi's death and the Battle of Sekigahara, which saw Tokugawa Ieyasu usurp power away from the Toyotomi regime, Yorodono would raise Hideyori to be resentful and suspicious of the Tokugawa, something which would in time contribute to the great deal of tension that would finally erupt into the Siege of Osaka, the largest samurai conflict of all time and the one which brought an end to the Sengoku period. It was here the Tokugawa would finally defeat Hideyori, leading to his and his mother's deaths in 1615. They had ensured that neither the Toyotomi nor the Azai bloodlines had gone away quietly into the night. And this, I feel, is the perfect place to bring their story, the story of the Azai, to a close. All in all, the Azai remain a very fascinating samurai family, one which arose out of the chaos of the Sengoku period and would come to play an integral role throughout its most climactic final years. Once again, I want to thank Nobuyumi for helping me out with this video. I will leave links down below where you can check out more great content from him. Also remember, if you want a say in which clan history I cover next, the best way to do so is by supporting the channel on Patreon. But with that said, thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most informative.